Hello and welcome back. This is the third presentation in our Construction Grammar series, and it's the second part of our comparison of Construction Grammar to alternative approaches. Today, we will look at generativism. In the last video, we saw that structuralism considers language to consist of words which are meaningful, as well as meaningless rules. In contrast to this, Construction Grammar argues that four meaning pairings, constructions, are at the heart of grammar. Now today, we will explore in more detail the difference of construction grammar and generative linguistics. Probably the most famous exponent is the founder of mainstream generative grammar, Noam Chomsky, the most famous and by far the most influential linguist of our times. His publications include Syntactic Structures, 1957, in which he started to develop his transformational grammar, 1965 aspects of the theory of syntax, which put forward the claim that language is innate and that there is a universal grammar. And the model was later on refined in lectures on government and binding, and finally in the latest approach, the minimalist program, which started in the 1990s. Chomsky started out criticizing behaviorist empirical approaches. He argued that language is an innate mental system, and this mental system is called universal grammar. For him, knowledge of a language means producing and understanding an infinite number of sentences. What is generative about this approach? Well, the mental grammar is supposed to produce or generate an infinite number of sentences by means of a finite set of words which are meaningful, and rules or parameters or principles, however you want to call them, which are meaningless. Another huge claim of generative grammar is that performance only partly reflects our competence. So the idea is that whenever you're ill, tired or weary, you make more mistakes, and performance is riddled with mistakes, at least according to Chomsky. Simplifying somewhat and looking at a very early stage of transformational grammar, it's an item and process grammar. So you've got items, let's say Tarzan, Jane and Kiss, and these would be filled into a deep structure like Tarzan, Kiss in the Past, and Jane. And then, depending on the sentence that you have, whether it's an active or a passive sentence, transformations would apply. So in the active sentence, you will get the surface structure Tarzan, Kiss, Jane. And in the passive sentence, a transformation would take place that would turn Jane into the subject, change the verb phrase into was kissed, and put the agent into the optional biphrase. While the details of the theory have changed over time, it's important to note that the transformational bit that changes the deep structure into surface structure is a purely syntactic one. That's a module of its own that's not affected by meaning at all. This kind of approach allowed Chomsky an explanation of ambiguities like visiting relatives can be boring, where it's either the relatives that are visiting you that are boring or you visiting them can be boring by having different deep structures for something that just ends up with a similar surface structure. Also, it allows for an explanation of related constructions, active and passive, for example, because these are assumed to have the same deep structure, but just end up in different surface structures because of transformations. And it's important that construction grammar must also explain these, that construction grammar must also have an explanation for how constructions are related and how structures which look the same on the surface can have different meanings. On to a couple of further developments. In the government and binding model, the idea was that the lexicon feeds D structure, and then you get movement operations, and that gives you the S structure. Now, in minimalist approaches, D and S structure have been dispensed with, and it's just one level where movement occurs, where elements sort of are changed around. And then after movement has taken place, you feed this into phonetic form and logical form, so the pronunciation of the structure is separated off from the meaning of it. In generative grammar, what allows children to acquire language is universal grammar. And as part of universal grammar, you also have covert, hidden information. So like, for example, functional categories like inflection, where tense or agreement would be encoded, or complementizer, where the elocutionary force of a sentence would be encoded. So in a sentence like firefighters cut the men free, you get quite an elaborate structure that is mostly predetermined by universal grammar. And then the lexicon just enters the words into the right kind of spaces. Firefighters goes into the spec of little VP, the man goes into the specifier of VP, and cut goes into the verbal slot. 
and after that you have structure changing operations that move elements, for example moving firefighters to the specifier of the inflection phrase, where it would check agreement, and cut moving into the little v position. There is no way I can do justice to a full-fledged minimalist or generative approach of these sentences. But it's important again that for this to work, for firefighters cut the man free, you need to adopt a lexicalist approach. So basically, before you enter cut into this tree structure, before you start combining um, in a merge one by one structure all these individual elements, cut must already be complex transitive. That's what a lexicalist approach means. So this special meaning of cut that we get here, the complex transitive one, must already be done in the lexicon. Again, we've seen this in the last video, construction grammar is different. For construction grammar, input is important, input leads to generalization, and that gives us schematic constructions. So they elected him president, she considered him a fool, he wiped the table clean, gives us the resultative construction, which has got slots for the agent, the patient, and the state. And we can fill in firefighters cut the man free into that and get the desired meaning, so that the firefighters cause the man to become free by cutting. Summing up, construction grammar argues that language isn't words which is meaningful and syntax which is meaningless. Mainstream generative grammar, however, would argue that language is modular, that the lexicon feeds the syntax, which is then an independent module, and there's merge and movement operations, and then only afterwards when the syntax is done, the information would be moved to the phonetics and to the meaning module. Construction grammar is strictly non-modular. For construction grammar, form and meaning always go together. It's also a non-derivational approach, so you shouldn't assume movement operations of the type that we've seen in the generative grammar examples. Now, so far I've only shown you that the two are different, but the claims that they make can obviously also be subjected to empirical evidence. And as we will see in this course, a lot of the language acquisition data now points to a construction grammar point of view, and not to a generative grammar one. At the same time, in my lecture on cognitive linguistics, I discuss in much more detail the kind of evidence that generative grammarians have put forward in defense of their theory, and I discuss it a bit more critically. So if you want to have a closer look at that, you're free to check out the videos in the cognitive linguistics lecture series. For now, all I can say is that universal grammar claims to explain language acquisition, and that's something that construction grammar must also do. Construction grammar must offer a competing account of how four meaning pairings are actually the starting base of language acquisition. Later on in this course, I will flesh this out in more detail and give you empirical evidence that argues for a construction grammar approach to language acquisition. Okay, thank you very much again for your attention. See you next time.